Uh, the wisdom and experience of Robert Craddock is such a valuable resource to us every Monday, maybe never more so than on a day like today. Hello to you, Crash. G'day, Jared, and uh, what a beautiful range of texts they were, and I particularly like the one about comparing it to the Tide Test in Brisbane in 1960-61. And you know what? The stories that we wrote last night were almost identical to what appeared in the Courier Mail in Brisbane the morning after. Couldn't this save Test cricket? Yeah. Because it had a pretty bland decade in the 50s. Not a lot happened. And they thought that this could be a, a firecracker. So, and and as your someone just said on the text, the, the, the scenes of the players from both teams uniting after the game, Pat Cummins swapping uh, shirts with Jamar, Shamar Joseph, was that was have happened 30 metres away from where the teams in the Tide Test got together after it. So that, that, they, there was this u- bond between those teams. And so it, it's you used the word romantic in your intro, and uh, it was all of that. It feels like one of those events that in 20 years' time it may very well prove a marker. Maybe it won't. Maybe the 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 course of Test cricket and West Indies cricket won't alter, but leaving there yesterday, it felt like this is a day that we'll look back on with great fondness, but also great meaning. Absolutely. Well, let's let's put it in its instant perspective. I, I believe it's the greatest upset in the history of the game. I, I mean, Barat Sundarajan, who's staying with me at the moment, we've sort of dug back through and had a look at a lot of things. And sure, about four years ago, Sri Lanka beat South Africa in South Africa. That was huge. And, you know, Bangladesh beat Australia, but that was sort of in Bangladesh on turning decks. I mean... Jared, this was at a ground where Australia had lost one of their last 35 tests, playing with a pink ball that Shamar Joseph hadn't even seen until a week ago, never mind bowl with it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it was an incredible story and an upset which, you know, at one stage on day one, when the West Indies were five for 60, they were $67 with bookies and no one was backing them, not, yeah. not even $5 punters. Why would you throw money away? And uh, to win from there was just, yeah, I, I it's just, you know, a, a, and on another level, Joseph's performance, and I'm sure you'd agree, and I heard you talking about it, instant entry in the Hall of Fame for overseas fast bowlers in Australia. You know, like, and I'm sure I heard you discuss on SEN, and that's 100% right. Kirtley Ambrose's seven for one was great in Perth. Richard Hadley decimated Australia at the Gabba in the mid-1980s. But hang on a minute. They were seasoned pros yeah. who, who were at the peak of their powers. This kid hadn't even played with a proper ball until 14 months ago. If you hadn't followed it in real time, Crash, you would say that we were laying it on too thick. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's his story, all the elements to it, Barat taking him shopping in Adelaide. Um, the you know the the falling of the tree and he go oh, I've got to get out of here and crickets his way out and then the five for in Adelaide which is charming in its own right but then out of hospital for all the world looked like he had a broken toe didn't even bring his shirts the way he spoke about it the doctor rang it no I, I, I'm not bowling today I can't even get out of bed and then comes and takes seven for. You, is it the best story? It's the story of the decade, isn't it? <laughs> Perhaps the century so far in cricket because there's so many academies and talent systems that everyone sort of goes the same way except Shamar Joseph. Like, you, you just couldn't believe it. But there's a freshness about him, Jared, and a willingness to learn. And Barat's pointed this out as well, and it's such a good point. What about his cricket smarts? Like... I felt Australia got into a bad mindset early in this test by complaining about the wicket, saying that, oh, yeah, the pink ball goes soft because of the hard deck. Whereas Joseph said, yep, yep, that'll do me. I'll try for the outside edge early. Then I'm zeroing right in on the stumps when it gets soft. And there's one thing about this kid, Jared, which makes him venomous, extra venomous. There's this little spot on the pace radar of about 145 kilometres an hour. And batsmen can generally handle anything that amount and under, but he get, he pushes it to around 150. And that the batsmen say that just that fraction of difference really hurries them. And it happened about four or five times yesterday where that the fastest bowler in the game, Joseph, just with that little pace edge, was really hurrying players. And I thought, you know, as well as bowling, 
beautifully and accurately. Like, isn't it funny? Azari Joseph from the other end was bowling short balls and he had four slips. And I was thinking, mate, you, you just, that's not the, not the plan for the day. Whereas the young kid in his second game, pitch perfect, pitching it up and then at the stumps. Four times he rattled the stumps. He's the only bowler in the whole test to do so. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it, it proves sometimes that cricket's a very complex and a very simple game. Yes. That's a good plan with a soft ball. Yeah. Bowl straight and bowl fast. And if they miss, guess got a bit of news for you, they're out. And... and, and Sheer pace creates its own issues. It doesn't matter what sort of wicket you're on or what sort of ball you're having, uh, you've got. And, and he read that beautifully. And uh, uh, it's just amazing to think that he hadn't even met his captain until two weeks ago. You, you think of that. The Australian team, the, their quicks have been together for a decade. They played 11 day-night tests. And they were out bowled by a kid who had never seen a pink ball until last week, never bowled with one, but he just read the conditions pitch perfect. It's so preposterous. I was just curious, as you were watching it unfold, Crash, what what, what were you thinking about? What Where were you drawn to? And, you know, we, we, when there's a, a romantic story developing and the Cinderella run is on, it, it's sort of hard not to buy into it. It, it, it is. I, I was thinking that this could be one of the biggest stories you ever cover because it could be another tied test, the second tied test yep. in the Gabba, and it was only eight runs away from it. I was thinking that Australia were a little were complacent, Jared. Every guy sort of – there were guys who just left it to the next guy. Like, name me the batter yesterday who said, hey, hang on, Stephen Smith is still in. That'll do me. I'm just anchoring in for the next hour. Thanks very much. Did anyone have that thought? No. I, I, I couldn't see it. And, and and just and sure, Shamar was. There was no sense of good luck about it, was it? He just out bowled them and outplayed them. But uh, yeah, as it was building up, and I just thought it was funny, Jared. The most cold-hearted judges of all, the bookmakers, <laughs> waited until the eighth wicket before they installed West Indies favourites, as if to say. Four wickets down, this isn't going to happen. Five, no, you can't. Six, oh, no, well, I don't think so. Seven, oh, maybe. Eight, whoa. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I just I just love that. Because they said, this isn't going to happen, is it? And we're a bit like that, to be fair, because there, there always seems to be someone around who would do the job for Australia. But I've got to say this, when Pat Cummins got out, and he's so often that last stick that you, you can rely on, isn't he? When he got out, I thought, I think they're gone. Uh, it felt like there were three possibilities and it was going to deliver one. It almost sort of felt fated. It was either going to be that tie, Steve Smith was going to hit the winning runs for his 100, or Shamar Joseph was going to complete the story and bowl the West Indies to victory. It just in real time, it felt like we were going to get one of those picture-perfect finishes. Oh, a absolutely. And, you know, the, the follow-up to it was absolutely delightful when, you know, Brian Lara was seen disappearing into the corporate suites where he purchased two bottles of champagne and just happened to be walking past a press conference when it was on. So he pulled out his phone and taped it and the players were referring to Lara in the press conference. Jo um, Joseph said to do it in front of the great man who's standing there and Lara was smiling with his camera out. And then when he said, I, I, there's something I have to say, I, I will play all the games for the West Indies. I will commit. I, will, I want to be a test cricket. Yes, sure, T20 will have its place. And Lara slapped, clapped it by slapping his hip, yep. by clapping it and held the phone up. So it's just that sort of stuff. That, that just doesn't happen in cricket, you know. And so it was just a, an, another great memory of the day. But the one thing it, that struck me about this Australian team, Jarrett, in this loss and all summer, they've got a lot of things and they're a very good team and they'll win more than they lose. But the one thing they don't have is an aura, an aura of intimidation. I've never seen two teams look more comfortable against them. And I say pretty you know, average teams than Pakistan and the West Indies this year. They get on well with them. They walk on the field relaxed. They like them. They like the Australians. And <clears throat> it's funny, remember the old days when Australia had a real hostility about them and that intimidated teams on home soil and crushed a lot of them it really did we saw it you could tell in their body language i saw the west indies when they were coming on for that last session yesterday 
And they were laughing and telling each other jokes and, you know, there was a few winks in the Australians' direction and, and, and that's what this team doesn't have, the Australians. They just play a different way now. And I'm not saying, Jared, it's better and I'm not saying it's worse, but I'm saying it's different and they don't scare teams like they, like they used to. Yeah, maybe separate that. There was this beautiful moment as the two teams were walking on for that final flurry of play where Joshua De Silva, the keeper, went up to Steve Smith. And you could see from afar as what they were acknowledging was that they were about to be part of something special, whichever way that it went. So that was, that's sort of what planted the idea of it, that it was so romantic. The, the 97 team, so the last team to win here, it's, that's why I just think about how unlikely all of this is. It had Kurtley Ambrose, Courtney Walsh, Ian Bishop, Brian Lara, Carl Hooper, Jimmy Adams, Phil Simmons. So to win here in Australia, which we've seen is just so difficult, and only these great Indian teams have been able to do so in recent times, is this bunch of no-names have been able to do it. And, yeah, you talk about Lara at the press conference, Ian Bishop taking his his selfie, the raw emotion of Carl Hooper. Uh, we've heard from Phil Simmons this morning. So it, it, it is reverberating right through West Indies cricket. What might it mean? Because they have been the touchstone of the, the evolution of test cricket and the most worrying aspects to it, to the point where, you know, they were, they, they were borderline extinct ahead of yesterday. Well, okay, there's a couple of things. Firstly, it's so sad that Australia has not toured the West Indies for nine years. I mean, and even then it was a two-test series. I remember guys like Shane Watson and Adam Voges, who seem to be gone forever, they were in that last test in the Caribbean. We're scheduled to play another two-test series there in a couple of years. I, I, I tell you what, I, 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 rec- I don't think this will cause an expansion of test cricket in the West Indies but it will give them a better chance to hold on to what they've got to ensure that there are two tests in, the, in a couple of years against Australia, to ensure that they will tour Australia next time for more tests. And, Jared, that was really in doubt because Australia, I'm here to tell you, had basically given up on the West Indies. We treat emerging nations we have over the decades very modestly. Teams like when India was struggling, we went 10 years without touring there. Zimbabwe, we were very offhanded about them. Sri Lanka. And with, when the West, in the 1980s, Kerry Packer said, I want the West Indies in Australia every year. They're the draw cards, the kings, I need them. Yeah. And then, then we lost. So I think it will, uh, they'll hang on and it'll keep test cricket. What, what, never underestimate the value of a superstar. And that's what this kid Joseph could be. I know he's only played two tests, but they've got a poster boy. Yeah. Jared, that's what they've lacked. They've had bland generations since Brian Lara's retirement where they've lacked that. I know Shiv Chanderpaul was probably the most underrated cricketer in the world, average 50 in tough times, but he wasn't a poster boy. This kid's got pizzazz and chutzpah. It's great. He is so right about that. So the last one in this conversation is I feel like you and I independently both reached the same conclusion as the test was unfolding. So the events of Adelaide had been charming, but then there was something more to it in Brisbane that the West Indies cricket is not only worth saving, it's essential to save. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, a- a- absolutely. And, and, you know, it's not a sure thing. They don't get paid much at all. I-, I love the way he pledged his dedication to the West Indies. And at the other end, Joseph's got Alzari Joseph, who, you know, he's constantly been lured by T20 teams, but he still plays for the West Indies. Others have gone. I mean, I love that mystery spin of Sunil Nareen, but he's just a T20 journeyman who does his best. He could have had a lovely little, little uh, test career, I reckon. But so hanging on to them, it's not easy. It's easy in Australia, Jared, because our top players get about $2 million a year from Cricket Australia, a bit less maybe, plus, plus, plus. Yep. So they're fine. But if you're in the West Indies and you're getting one-fifth of that, you're really open to an IPL offer and anything that offers you decent cash. So, But save the Windies. As you say, they're the barometer team. And what about the charm? I, I was just... I, honestly, I, I can hear it in your voice too, but... We, we've seen a lot of cricket over the years, Jared, but I reckon that was one of the most interesting test matches I've ever covered and one of the most meaningful because 
for mine, the biggest upset of all time, and it could change the course of, of, of Test cricket. Not violently. You're not going to see the West Indies suddenly playing five Test series again, but just holding on to their future. I must admit, Hoggy's comments had passed me by. <laughs> Crash, you spoke to him afterwards. I did indeed. And hey, what about Craig Braithwaite? He goes the whole tour as uh, Mr. Measured, Mr. Understated, yeah. Mr. Sincere. And then he, he mentions Hoggy, bursts into the show and then shows us his guns. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like it was, that was incredible. I ring up Hoggy and Hoggy being Hoggy, the old colourful pot stirrer, and I, I love him to bits. When I said to him, he said, is that right? Really? It fired him up, did it? Oh, terrific. And uh, he just thought it was great, you know, that he'd, uh, like, a, a bit of uh, stirred him up. And I've got to say, Jared, he wasn't alone. There were parts, uh, we were all riding the West Indies off at, at various stages, leading into the series and at various times when they had soft spots and that. So, uh, but he thought it was great. And he was duly praiseworthy of the West Indies. He sort of said, look, isn't just just what the game needs? And, um he actually even said that uh, some of Shamar Joseph's drives, never mind his bowling, but his drives in the first test when he put on a lovely last wicket stand, remind him of the great Gary Sobers. So, uh, but yeah, Hoggy, <laughs> let's just say he was quietly enjoying the notoriety of it. Yeah, I'm sure he, I'm sure he was knowing Hoggy pretty well and having worked with him in the past. All right, just run your diagnosis over Australia for me, Crash. Well, I, I just think that they, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact is, I know they've retained a lot of trophies, but they've only won one out of their last four series. So they're not crushing the world by any degree. The bowlers are, are, are fine, but gee, the, the batting orders are worry. I mean, if we went back two months and you said to Manus Lovell Shane, you will not pass 70 this summer, he would be tremendously disappointed with that. You know, he averaged early 30s this season. Something's not quite there for him. He he's spoke to Barat in an interview with SEN midway through the summer about the burden of being a perfectionist. Yeah. Gee, I thought that was interesting. It was just a throwaway line, but he's never said it before. But the burden, perfectionists can do it tough in sport when things go wrong because they're forever tinkering and they can drive themselves stark raving mad. One quick theory on Manus, I just felt all that anxiety in the 50 over World Cup where he was going to be dropped nearly every game but held on for a different reason. But all those nights he went to bed in India looking at the ceiling thinking, I mean, I, I should be right, maybe I'm right. Insecurity is such a, such a tormenting force for a professional cricketer and he was insecure the whole tour. When he came back to Australia, he was tired. He played a shield game at the Gabba and I heard he said to someone after, I'm not sure whether I should play this game. And I've never heard of Marnus saying that about any game of cricket. So... Um, yeah, there's, he, he's just not, not quite what he was at the moment. Steve Smith was up and down. And, and look, Jared, in New Zealand, watch out for Tim Southey because the ball which gets Smith now, that one that comes back and hits his pads when he goes right over as an opener, that's, that's his specialty, Tim Southey. Come out with me outside the off stump just a bit further, just a bit further. Now, bang, LBW off stump. So that'll be gripping viewing in the two tests in New Zealand. And, um, yeah, so tra uh, Travis Head was hot and cold, didn't have a great summer, a magnificent innings in Adelaide, but a, go a king pair in Brisbane. It, it, and that's the, well, that was the hit and miss nature of his summer. So the, the batting lineup, I imagine Australia will uh, remain decisive and wedded to what they've chosen. So that's green at four. We've seen two test matches of this reformed batting order. What are your impressions? Well, it, it sh I know Steve Smith batted through the innings yesterday and it was a terrific knock and it was progress. But what I found, Jared, with long-serving players, we saw this with Mark Taylor and Ponting, they can have a little spike. But the overall form line with him is heading down. So I've still got to watch on Steve. I don't mind him at being opener. But I will say this, if he fails at opener... Do not take it as any certainty that, oh, he'll just go back down the order. His next step could be retirement if this doesn't work. As a senior player, I think he's looking at this maybe as his last challenge. And if he went back down the order, does that mean you drop Cameron Green, who's the only player in the team under 30? I mean, gee, that's a hard thing to do. Green's still finding himself uh, as a player. He was tremendously ordinary on... 
Saturday night, better yesterday. So when he, when you see him driving the ball down the ground, that's when you know he's he's feeling good in his own skin. But for a guy with a lot of ability, he still has that little bit of self doubt. So what the, the big thing about this batting order is simply this, Jared. It was the, the link men to the next generation are Smith and Labuschagne. Australia has planned for those two to bat for another two years and help everyone else seem a little bit more comfortable when Usman Khawaja goes in a year, he's 37 now, and and the other forces of form and injuries take their shape. But they want Smith and Labuschagne firing. And the fact that they're wobbling and just so-so, that's when the ship wobbles around them. In what you've said around Green, there, there's the – so we, we had a great conversation at the start of yesterday's play with a whole lot of correspondents from really thoughtful cricket fans, which ranged from the last time Australia put this sort of work into a player, it was Steve Waugh, and it paid enormous dividends. And then the idea is, well, Green's form is a little while in the past at the moment. And is it fair to plunge him up to four and send him to the New Zealand Green Tops without much behind him at the moment? It, is he ready to hold down this linchpin position? Because the the one four split has the two anchors to it. I, I Smith will figure it out at the top, but I don't know whether Green is ready for four, which is a position that he will ultimately hold. But whether that's now, that's the open question. The one thing I keep remembering, I spoke to him at the Gabba after he scored 90 in the Shield game, and he's a very downbeat, very modest sort of guy, a likeable sort of kid. But the most animated I've saw, seen him was when I said, so would you like to bat four for Australia? Oh, would I ever? And and that was his big plan. So I think he's almost over trying there at the moment. But you're right. It's a good thing. He's, his best form is a while ago now. But there's a common thread about most of Australia's all-rounders, Jared, and it's it's been the same for 90 years. And I don't even know why it is. They take time. Richie Benno took time. He had a lot of tours when he was just a bit player, Richie. Shane Watson, uh, Andrew Simons, wherever he was promoted to a new level, Andrew Simons, he always invariably struggled first up. And it just take for some reason, all around us take time to, to build in. You know, there's the freaks like Botham who just get out and go, but many, many of them have. And, and I don't mind that Green's a slow burn because he, he's getting experienced. Like, I'd love to see him in the leadership group, not, not to offer opinions, but just to listen because – Guess what? Got a bit of news for you. There's no player in the side five years younger or five years older than him. Yeah. Like, he, he is the solitary uh, representation for a decade. Like, for from, from the years 19 to 29, there's just green. So, I get it why you're trying to make. And, and the thing is, if he fails, it won't be spectacularly. Like, he'll take, like he did in this game, uh, a catch, wickets, and 30, 40 here and there, you know, that, that sometimes an all-rounder, you've got to be a little bit discerning on how you judge them. I think that's absolutely right, Crash, except that a batting order can't have that. Four is a linchpin. At six, you can take or leave runs, but you can't at four. That's why I think this is a much higher stakes gamble than what we've talked about in the past. And I have no question that Green will be a long-term player in this team. And I think it's been one of the cleverer things that I've seen Australian cricket do. And you don't want him out of the team for too long. But four is – you can't – when three's out of form and five is a um, – and I say this – is is streaky, four, four can't be a 30 or 40 player. No, it, it's a good point. The trouble is – if you're batting behind Travis Head, Travis intimidates him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah, if he yeah. comes in and, and he says that, he, he tries to make a joke of it, but it is the truth. If he's set when the time Travis comes in, he's fine. But it, it, if if he's batting with Travis Head and Travis is going bull at a gate and, and he comes in, he feels quite overwhelmed by it because Travis can just sort of completely go off. Look, he's an interesting study because he's the tallest player to ever bat for Australia. And um, I, I, I like the way he, he, he moves. He doesn't sort of move like a tall player. Like, have a look at 90% of the best batsmen in history. And I'll go Javid Dad, Don Bradman, Alan Border, yeah, uh, yeah. Ricky Ponting. What have they all got in common? They're, they're short guys with quick feet. Yes, you know, it yeah. seems to work. I'm not saying you can't be Chris Gale 
or Graham Smith or Barry Richards. They're all tall, but it, it is harder for these guys. And when they are a bit out of form, they look a bit ponderous. So, but I, I've I, I've got I like Green, and I hope uh, they'll give him the long run. And I reckon at some time in the next year, we'll be saying to each other, gee, I'm glad they stuck with him. He's come good. Yep, yep. Uh, that That's the wisdom and experience right there. So the day one crowd was excellent. You got it. School was back in Queensland, 23,600. The Australia Day crowd, 29,216. is one of the best cricket crowds I've been part of in many a year. Uh, 11,000. It was stiflingly hot on Saturday. The only pity of yesterday in all that happened is there are only 3,162 in to see it. What, have you got a little thought on a cause there? Yeah. Have, hey, when, when, when Barrett and I were walking up Vulture Street, there was not one person. And uh, sure, we're, we're a little bit early for the game, but we said, is this game still on today? It was incredible. There was 850 people there at the start of the day, Jared. Yes, I have. I think people have got out of the habit of not so much planning for day five of the test, but day four. A lot of people I knew had been, and of course, last year was a two-day GABA test. Remember that. Everyone I knew who was making plans for this test was anchoring in day one, two, or three. Yeah. It was almost as if day four didn't exist. That said, gee, I was disappointed. It was much like the Tide test in 1960, 61, where there was such a, there was you know really small crowd there at the end, but it did build up. And the famous stories people say, oh, there's, you know, 20,000 people who claim they're at the Tide test but weren't. But, yeah, it did have that vibe yesterday. It was a shame. But not a bad crowd overall for the test. Just kept Perth on its toes. Yes, and those first two days where you knew there was going to be play. And then the other thing I have to – nobody, it seems – so this is for for people, to, for the punters to answer. Nobody makes a spur-of-the-moment decision to go to a day of test cricket. They've already, they're planned. They're locked in. They buy their tickets in advance. They choose a day and try their luck. And that you don't go, oh, let, let, let's buzz off to the cricket today. It looks like it's going to be a thriller. That's true. And, and, and that's, a, that's a shame in a way. And, and that's where I thought the day-night test would help. It was overcast and it was bucketing down, as you knew, yesterday morning. But I still felt there was enough time. It's a shame. We, we, we don't do things on a whim like we used to, do we? Like I, I thought a lot of people would think, oh, this could be good. This is getting very, very tasty. And, and it was a lovely slow burn too, you yeah. know, like the day. Like it took – it was a, a you know, knife edge for hours. So, yeah, I was disappointed in that. It, 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 to the point where – didn't it have a sort of almost eerie feel at the end of it, Jared? It was funny. Yeah, it deserved a thunderous crowd there at the end. But that's how Test cricket finishes more often than not. It's this strange scale where the action builds to a climax and the crowds diminish day on day. And that's that's always been thus, it would seem. I did have a text a bit earlier on from a, uh, a dad and a son in Brisbane. Oh, yes, Shane... And son said, very disappointed and insulted by CA and the Gabba yesterday. As the game was coming to a close, my son kept asking if we could go. At the first break, with 28 runs to win and two wickets in hand, CA was still charging entry. Very sad. As those days of throwing the gates open uh, don't happen anymore. So you couldn't make that late decision to nick along. Shane telling us that, which is uh, more's the pity. So the call, Neil Manthorpe, our great friend, Crash uh, Talk Sport. We are in partnership there. Every ball on the SEN app across this test series, thanks to Henley. The Henley Mortgage Fund, $1,000 a month off your home loan for two years, all backed by Henley's $7 billion parent. I was on the plane, mercifully, it had Wi Fi, had KO going. The bloke next to me was watching it as well. We were ooing and ahhing right through the last 20 minutes of that. Where were you? <laughs> I was uh, in the Storybridge Hotel sitting beside Peter Lawler who had a minor issue in that he ordered a margarita pizza. And you know what he got? What? A margarita without the pizza. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, hey, and, and then had to buy a pizza and fill in the extra $2 for it. So <laughs> there you go. But, 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 yeah, the boys were good. What a day for Test Cricket, Jared. And I've got to say this. I, I think of a line by my old mate, Greg Baum from uh, The Age, who did a column once saying, the thing that really, really, really annoys me about baseball is that it works. Oh, yes. And the evidence is overwhelming. 13 wins and 19 tests. England came back from 190 runs down on the first innings, which is unspeakable. 
But baseball in the second innings got them off. After 18 overs, they were one for 119. So that 190 had sort of, in an hour and a half, they'd just sort of gone bang. And so it was incredible. Tom Hartley, the left arm spinner, when he came on in the first innings, they slaughtered him. And he went for 60-odd off his first nine overs. He held his nerve and took seven wickets in the second innings, Jared. But the stat which really interested me from the match was that Hartley conceded fewer runs per over bowling to these giants of the Indian game than Ashwin and Jadeja, the two Indian champions, did bowling to England. So they went off, they got collared as well. It's, it's the, England was so brave in this game. They are, I, I, I love the way they are playing, you know. It's undeniable, and, yep. Oh, and, and Jared, the two sneaky best watchers in world cricket at the moment are Zach Crawley and Ben Duckett, the England opening batsman. They get out and as if it's, it's like a cannon going off. And they're just a little ducket. He, play, he, he breaks every rule as an opener. He plays at nearly every ball outside off stump. Just hangs the old blade out. Gets something on most of them. And gee, I'm not saying they're the best batsmen in the world, but those two, gee, they're, gee, they're fun to watch. The, the thing we'll never know the answer to, Crash, late in the piece, folks attempts a stumping. Boomer has finished his shot and he jumps in the air and folks flicks the bales off and the unanswerable would be if he'd been out would Stokes have withdrawn the appeal and called Boomer back do you know what I've watched that replay about five times and was thinking about that and I reckon Stokes would have claimed it because I reckon he would have said it was in the art of making a shot and, and, and I reckon he might have claimed it. Your thoughts? I reckon he would have mangled the moral high ground and absolutely taken it and just shown the hypocrisy of everything that's happened around the Bearstow incident ever since is there was an opportunity that presented and England was desperate to take it and only missed by a whisker. I wish it had happened so that we could have added that to the conversation, but we'll we'll never truly know. I, he wouldn't have given the win back on Indian shores for all the money in the world. <laughs> it would have been fascinating, oh, was it? it? And Ben delicious. Folks, what a keeper! G, G's a good player, folks. D, you must just remind people next year, Austra next season, Australia's got five tests against India. The season after, five against England, and India is their key men are just growing old. It's very similar to Australia. And that's why this series next year could be a matter of which team's going to be tapped on the shoulder by Father Time first. Yeah. I just know that next season, some Australians are going to be crash tackled by Father Time. I can't even name you which ones because who would know? But uh, uh, it, it will happen to India as well. There'll be a Sharma or there might be an Ashwin or someone will go one season too long. So this is this glorious scenario that's that's looming for next season. And honestly, Jared, I just can't wait. Beautiful to talk, Crash. Uh, we'll do it again next Monday. Can't wait. Thanks, Jared. The See ya. Wisdom and experience of Robert Craddock.